All right, let's solve this problem, part two of the 1000 GeV collision. You've seen this already, but I just wanted to put it up again so that we are on the same page, so to speak. In the laboratory frame of reference, this proton of 1000 GeV has a speed V. This proton stands still. The center of mass of the system moves in the laboratory frame with speed V prime. We have calculated V prime, here you see beta prime, and we have calculated gamma prime, which is 23.11. So in the laboratory frame you will see the following. When this proton hits this proton, the center of mass will be here, of course. And that center of mass will be moving in this direction with the speed v prime. When that collision occurs, there will be in the center of mass the two protons, but also the new created mass, capital M. So that whole system, two masses of protons and capital M will be moving with that speed v prime in the laboratory frame. Go to the center of mass frame. This proton is moving in this direction with speed v prime. The 1000 GeV proton is moving in this direction with speed prime. I am standing in the center of mass frame. The center of mass stands still. I will see the two protons coming together to the center of mass which stand still as they collide. Instantaneously, a new particle with capital M is formed. So in that center of mass, which stands still in my reference frame, there, is now, there are now two protons and there is one particle with capital M. And in my reference frame, they all three stand still. Okay. So let's now move to our lab frame. Because capital M is produced with the maximum value possible, clearly in the lab frame, conservation of energy must hold, like in any frame for that matter. And conservation of momentum also holds because it is a collision. So con conservation of momentum always holds. Let's first look at the conservation of energy. The total energy in the system before the collision is gamma plus 1 mc squared. The gamma mc squared is the result of the 1000 GeV proton and the 1 mc squared is the proton that stands still. After the collision, all three particles, 2m plus capital M, are now moving with v prime in the laboratory system. So this is then the total energy after the collision. You solve for capital M, it's a second order equation, high school algebra, and you find 44.22 mass of a proton. So, so the mass that can be, maximum mass that can be produced in this collision is 44.2 times higher than the mass of a proton. Go to the conservation of momentum. Remember what we discussed earlier, that p squared is this quantity. The momentum is only in the 1000 GeV particle. There is no momentum in the particle that stands still in the lab frame. So this is the total momentum of the system before the collision. When the collision occurs, the momentum is now in all three particles because all three particles move with speed v prime in the laboratory frame and so the momentum squared gamma prime square minus one times the total mass c squared look at this equation you solve for capital m 
high school second order equation, very simple. By the way, yeah, yeah okay, there's no by the way. And you find that the mass is 44.2 times the mass of a proton. All right, we're almost there. The last one, the last solution, may be a little bit more difficult for you. If so, you can ignore it. Remember that E squared is m squared c to the force plus p squared c squared. Look here. That equation. So E squared minus p squared c squared is this. Take a single particle. For instance, take the 1000 GeV proton. If you calculate E squared minus p squared c squared, you find this. That's the rest mass of that one particle. Ah, oh, it's the rest mass squared. I would say the rest mass energy squared. Now, if you change the reference frame of that one single particle, clearly, if you take E squared minus P squared C squared, you must still find the same rest mass squared because that is a property of that one particle. Now I make a jump that you may find a little difficult. If we're not dealing with one particle, but with two particles, which is the case of our 1000 GeV proton and the one proton that stands still, then E squared minus P squared C squared for that system must also be independent of your reference frame. Whatever the meaning will be of that e squared minus p squared c squared, you will see that very shortly, it can not depend on the reference frame. We call that Lorentz invariant. Let's go to the lab frame. And let's calculate e squared minus p squared c squared. Remember, this is now not just one particle. So you will not find this thing. You will find something very different. e squared minus p squared c squared. e squared is this. We've seen that before. p squared c squared, we've seen that before, except that the c squared now becomes c to the fourth. So this here is e squared minus p squared c squared in the laboratory frame. That is now of the entire system, not just of one particle, but of the entire system. That must be the same if I move to any other reference frame. I'm going to move to the center of mass frame. So when I go to the center of mass frame, then I have e squared minus p squared c squared. But e squared minus p squared c squared has no momentum. So there is only the rest mass energy squared, which is the sum of the masses squared times c to the fourth. What I forgot to mention is that if you massage this, algebraically, you will, use, you will lose your gamma squared. You will see there's a gamma square here and there's a gamma square there. And you will lose that. You will find then this value. And that value must be the same as this one. Because we argued that there's Lorentz invariance so e squared minus p squared c squared must be the same in all reference frames. This is the value in the lab frame. This is the value in the center of mass frame. They must be equal to each other. Forget the c to the fourth. You can scratch that out. Take the square root of this. If you want that, then you get the square root of t type 2 times gamma plus 1 times m is the square root of this, 
which is 2m plus capital M. And guess what? Capital M is 44 plus 2, uh, 44.219. So I've shown you now that all four of my solutions all find the value 44.219. Special relativity is not easy. It's not intuitive. Newtonian mechanics is much more intuitive. But this is important. This is what makes the world tick when we deal with high speeds and when we deal with the Large Hadron Collider and we want to make new particles. This is what matters. Remember, Nobel Prize was given for the discovery of the Higgs boson, which has a mass which was about 125 times larger than the mass of a proton. Okay? I hope you're not shocked by all this. I hope we will still be friends after this. Today is January 2nd, 2018. I have no idea when I will post a problem, no idea when I will post the solutions. It may be in February, maybe by the end of January, maybe in March, I don't know yet. But I hope you like it. If not, just tell me and we'll stay away from special relativity. Have a nice day, take care, and yes, we will remain friends. This was part two, the end of part two.